1 to 4. The word of God reads. Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples said to him, Lord, teach us to pray as, he, as John taught his disciples. He said to them, when you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us and lead us not into temptation. And it's good to read the word of God. So gracias, Lewis, and merci, Mahan. The word of God is good for us to read together. So what would you make? What would you make of a giraffe that wanted to be a cat? And the jack, giraffe says, I'm very big, so I'm not going to eat much. I'm going to want to shrink myself. And I'm going to say, meow, meow. And I'm going to chase mice. But what would you think of a giraffe that wanted to be a cat? What would you think about a dog that wanted to be an elephant? A dog that wanted to be an elephant. What would you think? What would a dog want to do? What would a dog do that wanted to be an elephant? Well, it would eat lots of food, wouldn't it? Eat lots and lots and lots of food and get very fat and end up slumped to doing nothing. Or it might just continually pull its nose to try and make sure it had a trunk. What would you say to a dog that wants to be an elephant? <coughs> what would you say to a giraffe that wants to be a cat? You would say, get real. You are not a cat, dear giraffe. And dear dog, you are not an elephant and you never will be. Just be what you are. Be what you're called to be. Be what you should be. And what would you say to a person who does not want to live for God and serve God? What would you say to them? You'd say to them, you've got to get real about who you should be, who you're called to be. Human beings, and I'm looking at a few human beings this morning. Do you know what? As a dog is called to be a dog and a giraffe is called to be a giraffe. Your calling is to be for God. A true human being lives for God and serves God. Every other human being is failing to be what they are called to be. So, for ourselves this morning, the challenge is that we would be people who live for God and serve him. We are in this passage of scripture, which starts in Luke chapter 9 and verse 51. Starts in Luke and chapter 9 and verse 51. The Lord Jesus is on the way to glory and he's going through the cross. And as we've seen in the passages we've looked out, uh, looked at, uh, following on from that, we have seen how we need to be a people who serve God. And we serve God by revealing him to others, telling others about him. And we are a people who are to live for God, to be caring and compassionate. And we need help. 
We need help to do that. We need help from God in order that we could live and serve. And so last week we thought we need to be listening. We need to be listening to God. We need to be hearing from God. And this morning we are going to think about how we need to be praying. We need to be praying so that we can be those who listen to God properly. We need to be praying so that we are in touch with the living God who can help us to live and serve properly. So that's what we are about this morning. We are a people who are called to pray. Uh, can I just say here, if, if you have never come to the Lord Jesus Christ to enjoy this life, which is true life of living and serving him, you need to find forgiveness for your sins so that you can come into this life through Jesus Christ. And for us all this morning who are true Christians, there is this, 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 this necessity for us to get involved in living and serving for God, living, living for God and serving him. And we need to be praying. Amen. We need to be praying. So let's uh, come into our passage this morning. And we're going to see how we have a family prayer here. We're thinking about this is the family prayer that we need to have. So we're in. We're in Luke's gospel in chapter 11 and verses 1 through to 4. First of all, we're going to think about our need. So we're thinking here about how uh, these disciples know that the Lord Jesus is praying. So we're in our first point this morning. Our first point this morning is our need. And our need is is to be praying. This is our first point. So the disciples are aware that the Lord Jesus had been praying. His followers are aware that he has been praying. And the disciples say, Lord, teach us to pray as John taught his disciples. So what's the thinking here? What is going on here? John, he had some disciples, and they were really effective for God. John had a big impact. And what did John teach them to do? He taught them to pray. So his disciples think, we're followers of you, Lord. We are disciples of you. In order for us to be effective, we need to be praying like you pray. We want to know how to pray. We need to pray, else we will not be effective in what you have called us to do. And what you have called us to do is what? You called us to live in and to serve you. And so they ask, Lord, teach us to pray. We need to ask that same question because we have the need. We have the need. If you want to be affected for God, you need to be praying. If you want to be able to hear the message from God, as we are thinking about last week, you need to be praying. We thought last week, didn't we, about how a people who are praying and worshipping, that is not listening to God's word. That is bringing prayer and worship to him. But the people who pray and worship they're the people who hear from god because they're bringing their whole lives to god so how is it with our praying are we praying is felton evangelical church a praying church do you want felton evangelical church to be a praying church do you want to pray in your life well let's make it simple as this if you want to have an effective life then you must be praying and if you want to be in an effective church we must be praying 
Pray. Prayer is at the heart of life. People who don't pray don't live. Churches that don't pray don't live. If you go to another church, and for those of you who are at this church, which praise God is so very good, make a priority of praying together with the church. It is such an important thing. So how are we getting on with our praying? How would you evaluate the praying at Belton Evangelical Church? How are you contributing to the praying at Belton Evangelical Church? When you hear of the prayer meeting, you say, that sounds a bit boring. I'll give that a pass. When you hear about where opportunities to pray online through Zoom, do you think, yeah, got to get involved or not bothered? Feltham Evangelical Church, particularly the members of the church, I have a little plea this morning. We will be rising up to live when we really get praying. Thank God for the praying we have. I think we got a long way to go. I say lovingly and carefully. Brothers and sisters, we have a need to pray. Lord, teach us to pray. Then we have, secondly, the address. The address. Our address. Our, and what I mean by this is how we speak to God. It, it just seems here that when the disciples ask for pray, uh, how to pray, the Lord Jesus is very happy to teach them. Very happy to teach them. And he says, Father, when you pray, say, Father. Notice he doesn't say, when you pray, say, Master. Or when you pray, say, Lord. He says, Father. Now, there is a proper sense that we can use the term Master to concerning our God and our Lord Jesus. And Lord, he is Lord. Our Lord Jesus is Lord. But they, the Lord Jesus says, Father. That's why I say to you this morning, this is the family prayer. This is the prayer that the family pray together. The church, as God's people, pray as family to one father notice it says in verse three it says give us in verse four it says forgive us our it's not me it's not my it's us it's together we pray together to our father some of you have had no father that you've ever known but through salvation in Jesus Christ, you do have a father in heaven. Some of you have had very bad fathers. All of us have had imperfect fathers. But some of you, the term father means nastiness, means ill treatment. But with this father... I say to you, he is good. He is kind. He is the provider of all that we need. He, when you speak to this father, he will always work everything for good for you. Yeah. Always. Okay. He's got no bad motives. He's your father. He's kind and he cares and he's always working everything for good. So we can come to him. 
and we can bring everything to him. Philippians 4, we read these words, rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I will say rejoice. Let your reasonableness be known to everyone of the Lord is at hand. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgivings, let your requests be made known to God. The peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. But in everything, in everything. And I think that means everything. Becoming to God. We bear a lot of pain and we lose a lot of peace. Because we don't carry everything to God in prayer. So we need to be praying. You say to you, nobody else is interested. You say to me, nobody else is interested in my life, my situation, my being away from home. I say, you have a father. He's interested. You, you say, I can't trust anybody else because I don't know who I can trust anymore. And I say, you have a father you can trust and you can tell him about it. And he's a working, active father. Islam has 99 names for God. And not one of them is father. We have a father and that tells us of relationship that tells us of shared relationship we are sons and daughters of one father and we speak to him together and the term father in the original is not a distant term it is a we might say a term of close Somebody who wants us to have a closeness to him. And so we speak to our father, our father. So that was the second point, our address. The way we speak is to call our God, our father. I just want to say, as we come into these statements that are made, I think they are meant to give us what I might call prompts as regard to the content of our prayer. It's not as if we, as it were, read these statements in a minute and that's our praying for the day. We're to stop and think as we come into these statements, hallowed be your name. And we think, how can we hallow his name? Well, let's move on then to our third point this morning, which is our desires, our desires. What are our desires? As we're thinking about this, we can start to think, here is a good father. He has been so good to me that he's brought me out of death and sin and hell, and he's brought me to know him in and through Jesus Christ. That's why I can call him Father. He has changed my life so that now I can move to live for him and to serve him. When I followed my own way, I ended up in a mess. But now I've been brought into a new way of life. And so our desires as the children of God, as true Christians, should not be about what I want, but we should be about what God should have and what he wants. So we have these two desires, I call them, which start off our prayer. As we speak to our Father, they are, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come hallowed be your name your kingdom come so we would want what's this word hallowed what it means respected spoken well of honored 
seen as being important. The name tells us who somebody is. When you hear somebody's name, you say, ah, that's what I know about them. That's who they are. If I speak of Mark, I speak of, say, Mark, Mark Henderson. Many of you all know Mark, and you immediately get thoughts about who he is and what he does and what it is that is represented by that name. And so when we're thinking about the name, we're thinking of all that God is. All that God is, as the creator, as the maker, as the perfect Lord God. And we want him to be respected. He is worthy of respect. I only have breath in my body because he has given it. We only have the wonderful blessing of salvation because he has given it. We want him to be respected. He is the great God who is kind to us. And when people do not speak well of him, it hurts. And sometimes we might say to somebody, you should not speak that way of God. In fact, in daily conversation, some, it, it, we might say to somebody who's speaking of, of, of uh, somebody at work or something, we might say to them, who's, they're speaking in a very bad way about somebody else, we might say, hey, 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 uh, show some respect. You know, show some respect. Don't speak like that about them. And so she, we should desire that concerning our God. When he's not respected, we are grieved. And then the second desire, I mean, my third point about our desires, our second uh, desire is that his kingdom would come. His rule would be known. Who rules in this country? We are in the kingdom of Queen Elizabeth II. She reigns here in this country. She's the queen of this country. Well, we're thinking here of a greater kingdom. We don't know how long our queen will live for, but we're thinking of an eternal kingdom, the kingdom of our God, the reign of our God. And when the reign of our God is known, it is always good, it's always beneficial. And we see the kingdom around us today and we see people being selfish and sinful and turning from God. And we think, Lord, your kingdom come. We long for a better day, Lord, when you reign on this earth and when you are known. But now we can pray for your kingdom to come. We want him to reign in our lives and in the lives of others. We want him to be in control. We want people to come under his reign because what we're thinking about this morning, it's always good. Who's in charge matters, doesn't it? Who's in charge in your workplace and in your school? It matters. And when God is in charge, when the king is in charge of your life, then it's good. It's good. It's good. So if I see somebody's life and I see a messed up life, I think immediately they need this God. They need this king to reign over them. They need the gospel. They need Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior so that they can come under the reign of God. And so as we pray, your kingdom come, we're praying to be evangelistic. Do you know that? Because we want people to come under the reign of this king. I've been brought under the reign of the Lord Jesus Christ of the eternal God. And he's the most beautiful thing that's ever happened to me. And I want others to have it. So we evangelize and say, hey, there is a better way because there's a better, a better ruler. And in the church, we're a people who long to be more and more under his reign, following his word. And so we're praying, Lord, help me, help me, help me to go more into your way. I don't want my way. I don't want the way that I'm going. I want your way, oh Lord. I want you to work everything out. And we pray that together as we are, as we're a church here, we pray for one another.
So just stop and think then, how do we pray? How, what are our desires in prayer? Are they like this? Hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. Or are they something along the lines of, Lord, sort this out for me so my life will be a bit easier? He thought about Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego and their desires. And their desires were very much, I think, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come. On your reign, we're not going to go for these gods and we're not going to go for you, Nebuchadnezzar. We're going to go for your reign. So there's a big purpose God has. His big purpose is that his reign would be known in our lives. And as we, uh, as we are, as Christians, I'm talking to us as Christians this morning, as God is working uh, through the difficulties of life to change us into his way, his kingdom is coming and his reign is known and God is working through the things that go well and the things that go badly. We want to be those who are continually desiring his name to be hallowed and his kingdom to come. And so we're a people who have the priorities of the gospel and we have a people of the priorities of godliness. The most important thing, if you're not a Christian, you need the gospel and you need to believe in Christ as your savior. The most important thing, if you are a Christian, is you need to be growing in godliness. Your health is not the most important thing. Your relationships are not the most important thing. You need to be growing for God. And so we're praying, Lord, help me to grow for God. I'm not saying we shouldn't pray for deliverance from sicknesses or hard circumstances, but I am saying we should have a priority that in this sickness, Lord, I want to know you and I want to grow for you. Whatever it is, that's the priority. Gospel priorities, godliness priorities. And in everything, we're bringing everything to our God. So here are our desires. And they are God-centered desires. I just want to stop a little minute there uh, and to think about, oh, what about, what about this God? Shouldn't he shut down that kind of thing? Isn't he, isn't he thinking, uh, isn't this God thinking a bit too much of himself? Shouldn't this God be a bit more humble? Imagine, um, imagine th it, it, Friday. That some people died. Imagine somebody, and it may well have happened, somebody, somebody was injured. Somebody got, uh, got, uh, got, got uh, hit by a tree. And you've got a load of people around. Uh, and a lot of people, a million around, say, we need a doctor, we need a doctor, we need help. We need, this man needs, he, he's in a bad situation. And, and there's a doctor standing there at the edge of the crowd. And the doctor says, oh, I don't want to make a show. I, I just, I, I, I'm, I'm too humble to get involved in that situation. And uh, the, the doctor just doesn't get involved and the man dies. And you might say, you're a doctor. You should have got involved and then everything would have been sorted out properly because you could have got involved to make sure that situation was sorted out. And he was saying, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to be pushed myself for. Everything would have operated well if that doctor had got involved. You see, it's like that with regard to our God. Everything works well when our God is seen as the one who has priority. Every, this is reality. Whatever you think about it, reality is that when God is supreme then everything works well, okay? When God is supreme, everything is working well, okay? It's not a case of God grabbing power or being arrogant. It's just a case of reality. He is the supreme one. We need to long for him and to see him glorify. Number four then this morning, I'm on point number four now, and that is our dependence, our dependence Give us each day our daily bread. Give us each day our 
daily bread. And I take it it's saying each day, day by day, one day after another. And it's saying, Lord, I'm depending upon you for my bread. I'm depending upon you for that which will keep me alive for another day. You're the one who gives it. Now, this is an issue for many of us, isn't it? Why? For many of us, we've got food at home which will last us for a few days. And so are we really praying, give us each day our daily bread? Well, we should be praying because this is the call in the family to be praying this. But it's establishing a very important principle is that is every day I'm depending upon God. There is never a time when I can depend upon myself. It says about the daily bread, my basic needs for today are with you, oh God. Please give me what I need today. There may be things I'm not aware of of what I need, Lord, but you must be the one who provides them. It's all saying I'm depending upon you. That food that I'm receiving, whether I bought it a few days ago, but I'm receiving it today, and it's your kindness, Lord. Don't forget that it is God who supplies all our needs each and every day, and we should ask him, when you're going to school, when you're going to work, when you're going about your business, you need God every day. So you ask him, Lord, be with me today. But I think it can also be taken into our spiritual food. We need spiritual food every day. Lord, feed me in your word, which takes us back to our study last week, how we need to be listening to the word and so we are asking, Lord, bring your word to strengthen my soul. There is a hint here as well that this should be prayed at the beginning of every day. And we should pray at the beginning of every day. I know some people are evening people or night people. Some of us are morning people. But it seems as though as we're facing the day, we're saying, give us each day our daily bread. Meet all of my necessary needs today, oh Lord. I'm depending upon you, not on myself, not on my strength. And finally this morning, if that was our dependence, so this morning we thought about our need, which is to pray. We thought secondly of our address. We need to speak to God as Father. Then our desires are the desires that the Lord would be hallowed and his kingdom would come. They thought about our dependence. So I'm finally to think about our danger, our danger. I think in the evening on January the 2nd, when I preached, I said that the worst thing that could happen to us in 2022 was that we would sin. And these statements here in verses three, verse in, in verse four, are all about the greatest danger that each one of us faces this day and every day is that we would sin. Why is it a great danger? The great danger is if you're not a Christian this morning, your great problem is you've got sin in your life, so you can't speak to God as your father. And Christians, our great danger is that sin is, comes into our lives. And although God is still our father, we cannot relate to him because sin has created a blockage. And you appreciating your father say, I don't want to be blocked off in my relationship with my father. I want to have fellowship with him because he's such a good God and he's so kind. And sin is such a terrible thing in his sight. I just don't want it to be around. And so our danger here is what? That sin would come into our lives. The danger is that sin would come into our lives. And so he's praying with this danger in mind. We're praying with this danger in mind. And, and the first point is basically, Lord, if sin comes into my life, I want it gone as soon as possible. And the second point is really, I don't want sin to come into my life, and it can quite easily come into my life. So when he prays, and forgive us our sins, for we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us, he's praying, if this sin has come into my life, Lord, please 
forgive me. And in Jesus Christ, the true Christian can know that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. And we can know, having faced our sin and how bad it is before God, fresh awareness that we come to our Father. And through the forgiveness that's in Jesus Christ, we're enjoying fellowship with him. We have forgiveness in Jesus Christ. And a fresh taste of it when that perilous thing has come into our lives. You see, the danger is that we don't deal with the sin. We just light as that. Some time ago, uh, we visited uh, uh, friends, some of you know, Ispan and Tundi Salanki, and they live in Hammersmith. And one of the things about going to their house is it can be a little bit intricate. And uh, as a reason, so in traveling there, I ended up doing a U-turn. And guess what? That U-turn was illegal. So guess what happens? Through the post, I get a fine. I was fine. I got this, uh, whatever it is, 30 pounds if you pay it within, six, within a fortnight and 60 pounds if you pay it with a, if you pay it afterwards. Something like that, isn't it? Uh, as, as it goes. And there I was. I was faced with this fine. I don't want the fine. It was just something I've got. No doubt there's a photograph there proving that I've done what I shouldn't have done. So what am I to do? What am I to do? Pay the fine. Get it gone. And so it's out of the way. I no longer have to bother with it. But if you don't pay the fine, what happens? Well, you start having, it's just there, isn't it? It's always around and you, you've got it. And it, it generally will get worse, won't it? And you probably end up in court because you haven't paid. And all kinds. Just deal with it. Get it out of the way. It's a bit like that with our sin, you see. Don't leave it around. Confess it. Deal with it and know that it's gone. But if I pay, I just want to take that a little bit further. If I pay the fine, say I, I get some money, get, I get a, a note out. What have I got there? A £10 note. Go and I take the £10 note and I hand it in and they say, that's a fake. We won't accept it. But the fine is still there. The problem is still there. And that connects us in with our verse, you see. If you are not forgiving others, if you've got no inclination to forgive others, you're just a fake as regards to asking forgiveness from God. Because people who are forgiven, who want forgiveness, are also forgiving other people. It says there at the end, in, in, and we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. Those who are willing and active in forgiving others can know that when they confess their sins before God, they can know the forgiveness. That it's not fake. It's genuine. It's a heart that just wants to know forgiveness and wants to give forgiveness. We are a people who are wanting to get sin out of the way when it occurs. If it occurs, we just hate it. But also we realize coming to the end of the verse, verse four, and lead us not into temptation. Guess what? I look at myself and I look at my life and I know how I operate and you know what? Sin can happen anytime. If I'm just left to myself, I, I, I can just fall into temptation and sin occurs. If I, if I see a certain thing, so it, it can grab hold of me and I can go into lust and I can go into all kinds of things. Sin grows. And so I say, I, I, I say, and lead us not into temptation, Lord. You're in control of everything, Lord. And if I just go my own way, I will fall into sin. Please, Lord. Please, Lord, help me. Help me that I will not sin, that I will not sin against you, that I will not offend you. You see, the great danger is sin. And the first one is when sin occurs, make sure that it's sorted out straight away. And the second one is make sure that it doesn't happen at all so that we can still walk in fellowship with our Father. 
And we know that we have hearts that are clean and clear because we've been kept away from sin and we can walk in fellowship with God. And as we're walking in fellowship with God and praying to him, we will be a people. Well, let's just stop there. Have we got the message this morning about prayer? Dear church, dear everybody, I say in our time here, let's be a praying church. And for others, for those of us who move on elsewhere, make sure you get in a church and be in a praying church and be a praying person and be pushing the church into prayer, encouraging others into prayer. Be an example of prayer. Do you say when you meet up with people, hey, can we just take some time to pray? Is prayer just part of your DNA? I think the family prayer is teaching us prayer should be part of family life. When we're meeting up together. Younger ones, this, was, can, be, this can be you as well. You younger ones, why don't you start and think about a prayer meeting amongst yourselves at this church as well? we praying together. And as we're praying, then we'll be listening and knowing the word of God and be strengthened, going back to last week's message. And as we're knowing the word of God and we're strengthened, we will be a people who are going forward to live for the Lord and to serve the Lord. And so that's my conclusion, you see, that when we are praying, we will be listening. And when we are praying, we will be listening. We will be also living for the Lord and we'll be serving the Lord. We'll be caring and compassionate. We will be a people who are wanting to see the Lord Jesus revealed to other people. And going back to where we started, we will be what we are called to be. A people who are alive for God, living for him and serving him. Any other, you know, this is... I, I say, everybody, this, we're not just dealing with lifestyle choice today. You know, you choose your religion. You choose what you get interested in. We choose, we're dealing with the very essence of life, which is to be for God. Any other life is substandard, is, dare I say, hellish, is self-inflicted misery. Jesus offers life. Let's get going and growing and being for him uh, together because this is the family prayer for a together people who want to move on. So, dear church, let us let's be for God. Let's pray. Let's enjoy. Let's hate sin and love the Lord. Desire the flowing of his purpose. I'm going to conclude with a hymn, and uh, which is mainly which is going to pick up some of these themes, um, focusing on the kingdom of the Lord to come, and let us uh, 